Our final uh, panel of, of the day, uh, the topic is supporting and sustaining quality journalism, uh, and we're going to try to talk about the ways that we can learn what um, works and what does not work as far as making sure this type of work uh, continues. And our moderator for this panel is Tom Glazier, uh, Program Director at the Democracy Fund, um, who is one of the uh, supporters of this event. Uh, I know Tom back from his days also at the New America Foundation. And he has been working uh, in this area. What was our pro program called in New America? Oh, yeah. media the Media Policy Program at the New America Foundation. And uh, so Tom has been engaged in these issues going back uh, a while now. He's also a doctoral candidate at Columbia University in their, in their communication program. Uh, so let me hand it over to Tom. Take it away. Thanks, Phil. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here at Rutgers. I'm a big fan of the faculty uh, writ large. I've known many of them for a long time. And it's just really exciting to be working with you so closely, Phil, and colleagues. Um, the final, our final panel is sort of, we, we, we started off today looking at what is quality. We moved through how to create that quality and how to create journalists who can produce good journalism. Then we examined what it looks like. Now we've got, I'm not sure it's the easy, I don't think it's the easy question. It's how do we support it? How do we sustain it? Um, sometimes that is boiled down to numbers and dollars. Um, but I think we have a fascinating set of speakers here who are going to look at ways to make it more attractive or more engaging. Uh, two pa speakers will speak to that directly, um, Craig in the sort of, I'd said, the offline sense and actually in the online sense. Um, Magda comes at this uh, really around what uh, the non-profit model and collaboration, which I think is critical, especially to those in uh, Jersey, uh, and looking at how collaboration is emerging through the good work of Montclair State and else, uh, and all the outlets in, uh, that are part of the New Jersey model, so to speak. Uh, and then Charlie Cradiville, who is really part of that, uh, is up last. Um, it's the end of the day. Uh, we want to get to drinks. Uh, and I want to keep it engaging and give ch a chance to people to uh, really ask questions, dig into things throughout the day uh, that they might have ha come, come to them, come to mind during the day. So I will be the friendly, gentle, but firm moderator in terms of timing. So uh, Craig, take it away. All right, thanks, Tom. Um, do I need the wireless, or can you hear me? Is that better? Is that better? OK, we'll do that. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Um, just remember, it's not me standing between you and your drinks. It's the other three presenters. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm Craig Aaron, and I'm the president of Free Press. Uh, Free Press is a national nonpartisan organization devoted to advocacy around media and technology issues. Um, so I'm here uh, not as an academic, um, not as a journalist anymore. I guess I'm a recovering journalist, uh, but as an advocate. Um, and uh, I'm also talking uh, not so much the great stuff on the last panel about things people had done. Um, and hopefully what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit of what we hope to do, um, and specifically what we hope to do uh, here in New Jersey over the next couple of years. Um, but first, a little background. Uh, doing a little research. Um, here we have CareerCast.com's uh, 2014 list of the uh, top 200 best and worst jobs. Uh, <laughs> this is the bottom of the list. Um, and you, uh, you may notice a few careers uh, relevant to our discussion here today, like number 196 and number 199. But, you know, as I like to say, uh, you know, it could be worse. We could be at a lumberjacking conference. Uh, it's not a crowd that requires me to review the parade of horribles of how we got here to this moment, this crisis in journalism, the rise of the Internet, the collapse of the advertising market, runaway media consolidation, shuttered and empty newsrooms, tens of thousands of journalism's, journalists losing their jobs, so much serious journalists replaced by, I don't know, water skiing squirrel stories. 
and, and you, you know, you don't need to tell me, I don't need to tell you this story because you were there, you experienced it. You know, I think we probably all agree the low point was when uh, Clark Kent quit the Daily Planet um, to go become a blogger. Um, but with all respect, and it's with a lot of respect to the journalists here, what I worry about the most and what keeps me up at night isn't your career prospects. Um, it's actually what those careers mean for local communities. It's what those careers mean for an informed citizenry and for a functioning democracy. And there's so many academic studies have showed us that after losing a daily print newspaper, fewer people pitch in with neighborhood groups, fewer people vote, fewer people run for office, uh, fewer people contact their elected leaders, and more incumbent uh, officials get reelected. Members of Congress who are covered less by the press do less work for their constituents. They show up to future hearings, they bring less money back to their districts, and there are plenty of studies that show a link between less access to news and higher levels of political corruption, you know, which might be relevant here in New Jersey. I, I, I don't know enough yet. Um, now, I, I, I don't think we really know whether civic engagement declines because people stopped reading newspapers or it's because the watchdogs, or too many of the watchdogs of those newspapers have been muzzled. But what's clear is that it, newsrooms are a public good. They benefit the entire community, whether those people are subscribing or donating or not, because those journalists are out there pounding the pavement and sitting in boring meetings and stumbling across things that government and corporate leaders don't want us to know. And when we lose that, when our newsrooms start to look like this, we've got a real problem. Um, and we can look at all those problems, the empty newsrooms and the missed stories and the squirrels, and you know, it's, it's really, really depressing. Um, but with apologies to uh, Joe Hill, I want to urge you, you know, don't mourn, organize. And with a few further apologies to Joe Hill, I'm not actually talking about organizing unions. Uh, I'm just talking about changing our approach to how we talk about journalism's importance, to how, about how we engage communities, and about how we change the relationship between newsrooms and the people they cover in ways that could benefit everyone. So when I say organize, I do mean forging relationships at the grassroots, listening to community needs, convening events, bringing people together with the goal of getting better quality news, absolutely, but also in ultimately creating a political constituency that's willing to fight for it. Uh, because I believe that democracy absolutely requires journalism, but I think journalism might require more democracy, an engaged citizenry that's actually demanding the serious work to hold corporate and government leaders accountable. And I'm, I'm increasingly convinced that the key, the real key to saving journalism isn't just a new business model or a big idea or you know, a rich benefactor like Tom. Uh, the, the best hope is in actually engaging the communities that our newsrooms are purporting to serve. And that ultimately you're not going to be able to serve the public interest without public involvement. And then the question becomes, who am I to tell you this? Uh, it's a fair question. Um, I, my group, Free Press, started 12 years ago out of a belief that there, without better media, there won't be real change on any issue that matters. And uh, the idea from the start was to give the public a voice in shaping media policies, in particular, that were being made in their name but without their consent. Um, and w we have a real fundamental belief that better media policy, looking at the structures, is the only way to get better media. Uh, and that really the only way to ever get media policies is to organize and advocate for them. And so we've tried to do that on a number of issues. And at our best, uh, we've been able to engage millions of people in doing things like holding back media consolidation and busting up some media mergers and rescuing funding, at least at the national level, for public media more than once. And uh, lately, we've especially been part of a huge upswell of public activism around internet issues, um, including a, a historic victory that happened on an issue called net neutrality, uh, hopefully some of you have heard of and were part of, um, that happened just a couple, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and what's been interesting in this work, uh, it, you know, the, the free and open internet, affordable broadband, privacy from unchecked surveillance, these are all going to be really important issues in the years ahead. But one of my fundamental beliefs and why I came to this work of media advocacy was because it's not going to be enough just to have access to the internet. Uh, it's not even going to be enough just to have free speech. If we're going to actually have a functioning democracy, 
then anyone who goes online actually needs to be able to find accurate and meaningful information about what's happening in their communities. In other words, they need journalism. Uh, and they need not just access to that information, but they need accessibility. Uh, they need the tools to actually engage with the media and to be able to tell their own stories. And when it comes to the organizing we've done on issues like net neutrality or SOPA PIPA uh, or, or, or surveillance, we've seen this incredible public outcry, but that same outcry didn't happen in the response to the crisis in journalism. It didn't happen in 2009 when big newspapers started shutting down, um, when, when sort of all the, these early warning signs were happening. Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, may, maybe from the activist side, a lack of clear asks. There's a, there's a complex relationship between activists and the press. Uh, there's a, a very deeply ingrained reluctance among journalists to touch anything uh, that, that reeks of politics or advocacy. And there are definitely some entrenched uh, institutions that are very, very resistant to change. Um, and I think among the public, there's also this sense of hopelessness, this, this sense of you know, changing the media. I, I can't even imagine that. The media is just something that happens to me, not something I could actually hope to change. Um, and I also suspect that nobody really tried. Uh, nobody really asked the public to get involved in a meaningful way. And so I worry sometimes that the future of journalism is going to be this, right? Panel discussions about the future of journalism. <laughs> I'm doing some editorializing in the cartoon, but it's, it's a different topic. And uh, um, I, I, I don't think it's unfair to say that too much of the discussion about how to save the news or how to nurture informed communities uh, has often excluded those who, who have the most to lose from this crisis in journalism the people actually in those local communities, and I don't exclude myself as an advocate from that critique. Um, but for all the talk about in big newsrooms and in small newsrooms about a commitment to serving the public, and a lot of us got into journalism because we wanted to do that, we wanted to serve the public, actually sitting down and talking to the audience and the broader community is too rare an event. There's reporting, of course, there's marketing, uh, but real engagement and two-way communication hasn't happened as much. Um, I think we need a different approach. I think we need one that's more grounded in local communities, one that collaborates with newsrooms and, and, and doesn't just antagonize them. Um, but I think if we're going to save journalism, and as an extension of that democracy, then journalists and their communities need to be working together more. That they need each other, because democracy and accountability won't happen without local journalism, but quality journalism won't actually survive without an engaged audience that subscribes to it and advocates for the conditions in which those outlets can thrive. There, there are some incentives out there to making this happen, and uh, I, I think, you know, if you're a newsroom, I hope you see that to retain, or, or a newsmaker, to retain, you need to retain and grow your audience, established newsrooms need to better understand their community's needs. Startups and smaller outlets need to introduce themselves to the communities they aim to serve, and both would benefit from more public ascertainment, greater engagement with stakeholders, and interactions based on community service, not just market research. And I think at the same time, the broader public and local community organizations need a platform to address how they're being covered, uh, and that they would benefit from a real, a much better understanding of how newsrooms actually operate, how newsrooms make decisions, and how that shapes everybody's ability to participate in the, uh, in the democratic process. And it, I figure what better place to do that than right here in New Jersey. Um, and so for the next two years, uh, Free Press is actually going to be deploying our team across the state to organize and try to build community around the news. Um, we're we're going to try to work to forge partnerships and collaborations with community groups and community leaders, with established and emerging newsrooms, civic and academic institutions like this one, and, and, and a diverse group of citizens from across the state. Uh, our goal for the long term is to prove that there is an engaged public that is willing to fight for quality news. And we picked New Jersey um, because it's a really interesting case study in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of interesting things are happening here. There's no question New Jersey has been hit by the crisis in journalism. But it's also a really amazing testing ground for new reporting models and collaborations. Uh, as I don't have to tell the people here, you know, you're stuck between two major media markets that aren't that interested in covering New Jersey. 
uh, and the academics, and I want to definitely attribute this to p famous journalism historian Paul Starr, and not myself, but you know, New Jersey is considered one of the worst covered states. Um, but we also know, we just saw how much good journalism is happening around here in the last panel. Um, you know, uh, people here know better than I do the work of the New Jersey News Commons, and it's, it's one of the most exciting collaborative journalism s centers in the nation. It's a model. Uh, for local experimentation. Um, we, know that, uh, we know that New Jersey is an incredibly diverse state. Um, oh, here, I even borrowed some artwork from the New Jersey News Commons. Fair use or something. Um, uh, you know, there's, 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 there's an, it's an incredibly diverse state with really interesting work happening around community engagement. Things like the Citizens Campaign, Sustainable New Jersey, Creative New Jersey, uh, all, all these folks kind of here along the bottom, you know, are doing really interesting public conversations about, about what can happen in this state. And we're really seeking to learn from those efforts and start com convening community discussions around sustaining the future of journalism here. We've got some great partners. We've got some support from the Democracy Fund, from the Dodge Foundation, where, with all due credit, uh, Josh Stearns, who's sitting here in the second row and is a former colleague of mine at Free Press, you know, did a lot of the thinking to shape this whole idea about actually going uh, into local communities. And you know, we're really eager to get out in the weeks ahead and, and work with a lot of people in this room. Uh, a lot of people are actually out there trying to do community journalism every day, serious journalism every day, whether that's happening at a big institution um, or whether that's you know, uh, smaller sites that are part of the news commons, that are part of the local news lab experiment. And there's lots of room for academic collaboration as well. Uh, and we're all already working with Phil and his colleagues um, to, to share information. Todd Wolfson, who's here at Rutgers but not here today, uh, is another partner that we're coordinating with. And I think, oh, he's still here, Brian Mercer, who will maybe wave his hand up there, from the Media Mobilizing Project in Philly, which is an amazing group uh, that does a lot of community-based organizing using the tools of the media and around issues of the media. Um, they're going to be uh, m moving into New Jersey as well to do some work together, um, especially in the southern part of the state. And my group, Free Press, we have 15,000 members uh, and growing here in New Jersey. So we, we think there's a whole network that want to do more things closer to home. Um, uh, we're also going to be deploying staff here in New Jersey. They're not here today, unfortunately, because they haven't started yet, but uh, they're, they're going to be starting uh, uh, just in a couple weeks. Uh, one of them is a former uh, re re Gannett reporter and an editor at uh, NJ.com who's been doing uh, adv advocacy actually on privacy issues for a number of years, wants to come back to New Jersey, wants to focus on journalism. Uh, and uh, my other new colleague overseeing our whole program, is uh, her name's Fiona Morgan. Uh, she's a longtime reporter who is now at Duke University um, we're finishing up a book with Jay Hamilton focusing on uh, how, how, how the community information needs of low-income communities uh, and how journalism can actually serve them. So they're going to be coming in and, and working a lot here in New Jersey along with our team of organizers. Uh, so what are we going to do? Um, this is really, really just the start. There's a lot of people whose uh, websites or logos may be up there who I've barely talked to. Um, I'm, we're aware of that. Uh, we're not trying to impose anything on anyone. So the first few months of this are going to be really intense outreach to better understand um, you know, uh, what the needs are, what the networks are, who we need to be talking to. And then over the next 18 months, what we want to try to do is organize um, some events. And we are, we are sort of zeroing in on focus in a couple of communities across New Jersey, um, Atlantic City, Camden, uh, the Jersey Shore, uh, up in Morristown, New Brunswick, Newark, um, looking at places, a lot of these have overlap where there's really interesting local experiments that are happening. A number of them, again, part of the local news lab project at Dodge. Um, we're not necessarily limited to these locations, but this is where there's been some early interest uh, and, good, and good networks, open to better ideas, open to other people we should be talking to. Um, but these are the kind of places we're looking to zero in on, as well as doing some cross-pollinating um, across the state. Uh, at these events that we're going to be uh, planning, and we, we have a long history of bringing communities together to talk about things like the future of the internet and broadband access, uh, as well as journalism and, and a number of other places. But we really just want to bring together newsmakers and community groups to discuss the future of news gathering. We want to facilitate that meaningful dialogue, and we want to explore strategies for supporting new models of local journalism. Um, we're very committed to elevating the verses of diverse communities in these debates over the future of news where they've often been missing um, and are really committed to creating opportunities for listening and collaboration and beginning to build a network that ultimately doesn't require a group like Free Press to sustain it, though, though we're happy to continue um, to advise. Uh, we're going to be doing some other things related to research. 
um, and popularizing some of the research that's been done, as well as trying to build some toolkits that newsrooms everywhere can use to really sh show their commitment to community engagement and use some of the techniques borrowed from other success stories as well as uh, you know, uh, uh, other movements and issues around community engagement. Um, uh, in the end, though, you know, it's not really just about piling up a huge stack of papers. That would be going backwards. Um, you know, the success is really going to be judged by the success of those one-on-one -on -one and small group meetings, uh, the success of the network you can actually um, leave behind. Um, and, and what we hope to leave behind is a, is, a, is a new conversation about the future of news in New Jersey and, you know, hundreds of local residents with the knowledge, resources, and access to the networks they need to actually be journalism advocates, collaborators, and creators. Um, uh, in the long term, you know, our goals are pretty big. You know, we want to figure out uh, how to create more sustainable newsrooms that embody transparency, accountability, and service to their communities. We want to, and, and we believe through community engagement, we can help create greater support for and investment in local journalism. Uh, and, you know, we want increased participation of community members in the news. You know, more community feedback, a greater diversity of sources, more help for reporters, um, which I think those better relationships translate into an increased willingness of communities to actually fight for journalists' rights, to gather and disseminate news, to access information, to challenge censorship. Um, and, you know, that we hope will translate into actually engaging policymakers in that discussion over the future of local news. Um, journalists have been fighting a lot of these fights by themselves, um, disconnected from their audiences that really need them to win those fights, that really need local journalism. Uh, and we weren't interested in creating the environment where that can be possible. Um, and so that, you know, hopefully leaves in the end a, a diverse and active constituency that cares about press freedom uh, and, pre and democracy issues and actually prioritizes them. Um, I, I see I'm getting the, uh, getting the hook here. So uh, the last thing I'll say is, you know, what we really hope to do is, is publish and amplify what we find, make sure that people across the state know about it as well as across the country, um, build some useful tools and guides that can be taken uh, elsewhere. Um, we, we're going to test, we're going to fail, we're going to make mistakes, but we hope to take what works, use it across the state, and use it across the country. Um, uh, so mostly what I want to do before I go is just say that, you know, we, we welcome your feedback, we welcome your ideas, you can see some of my contact information up here, so I hope you'll reach out, engage. If I haven't called you yet, I know I will be calling you very soon, or one of my colleagues will, um, and just look forward to future uh, conversations and collaborations, and, you know, once we get this whole journalism thing fixed, then we'll, you know, move on to Lumberjacks. So uh, thanks. Thanks, Craig. Um, never thought I'd see a lumberjack as part of a journalism presentation. Um, so moving, moving from outside the newsroom and finding sustainability through engagement outside, sort of Ashley, I think, will take this inside the newsroom and news practices. Ashley is a well, very well thought of uh, professor out of Wyoming, so well thought of that Kansas has stolen her. Um, not sure how she's going to get there. She may have to hop. But um, I'll pass things over to uh, Ashley. And I, if you have a presentation, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's up there. Uh, and while they're getting it pulled up, I will say I think the West might be taking me out. That is why my, I hurt my knee skiing a couple weeks ago. So maybe I should be in Kansas and not by mountains. Um, but I, I assume you'll all forgive me for sitting down. And microphone on, is that better? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, as Tom mentioned, my name is Ashley Muddeman. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wyoming, and I'm here uh, today to talk a bit about the work that I've been doing with the Engaging News Project, which is a research project that's centered at the University of Texas at Austin. It's founded and uh, directed by Talia Stroud, uh, who couldn't be here today because I think she's giving a presentation at uh, Northwestern or somewhere across the country. And uh, we also have research, uh, a research associate at Purdue University, Josh Skacko, as well as a number of graduate students at the University of Texas. And so I want to talk a bit today about our conversations with journalists and what we've found, uh, some tensions that we found uh, journalists seem to mention a lot in our presence, and then our approach to trying to fix those tensions, especially from an academic perspective, where we have a little more time and we have a lot of research background, where we'd really like to be able to help journalists using that research and academic background. Um, if you could pass the next 
Oh, thank you. Uh, we'll start with this quote here um, from Mark Franscuti from the Dallas Morning News. And he was an attendant at a workshop we gave at, or we held at the University of Texas uh, last year. And he mentioned this, that it's difficult to tell when metrics matter. Advertisers like impressions, journalists like to report what is important, but the metrics may not follow and then raises some questions as well. And this is a discussion that we had in detail with a number of the journalists at this workshop who kept mentioning how the, the things they have to measure the news and whether their news is successful aren't quite what they would like to be able to have. And I'm sure those of you who are uh, in the newsroom would be even more familiar with this than I am. Um, we can go ahead and uh, click again. And so just these are a couple of the metric systems uh, that, <coughs> excuse me, journalists have mentioned to us that they've been able to use. Um, Chartbeat, for instance, gives this preview of the things that they uh, give journalists when they are using this system in the newsroom about their metrics. So for instance, we've got uh, concurrent traffic sources, so it will tell you how much is in or how many people are on your news site in the first place, as well as how long people are staying there, visitor frequency, whether it's new uh, returning users, loyal users, where the sources are coming from, so internal links, social news, those types of things. And there are many others, but you can tell from this that what journalists have at their disposal are very impression-driven, click-driven, share-driven kind of metrics. We also found, uh, we did a, I, this is admittedly a very, very small sample size of a survey, so uh, don't generalize too much. But we did a sm very small survey with journalists that had either been in contact with our organization or who hadn't worked with us before. And we just asked them, what is your priority on a number of different metrics, not, or not just what we have up here. But the things that got the most, that journalists were saying were most important to them were things like increasing site visits or increasing page views per session, increasing time on site. So again, it's all the things that they already have at their disposal. Um, and you can see the chart here goes from very low priority at one and four is their highest priority. They do mention they wanna find new ways to engage audiences, which actually leads to this quote as well uh, from Sasha Cor uh, Corinan from the New York Times who again was at our workshop and mentioned that the business side looks at numbers and metrics differently than the newsroom. And so again, just like in that very small survey, these metrics are coming up, but people aren't quite comfortable with them. Not surprisingly, I, I like this chart. It's a uh, chart from the Pew Research Center from last year's State of the News Media. I'm sure most of you probably aren't too surprised by this, but it shows where news organizations are getting their funding. Most organizations are still getting their funding from advertising. So if advertising is driving the clicks, then that also makes sense that the metrics end up matching up. And this might be a little different for different news organizations and different uh, types of news in general. But overall, if advertising is still driving where people are going and the, the success of news, then uh, then these metrics make sense, but they aren't really satisfying, at least to me as an academic, and it seems like to a lot of journalists as well. And so our approach at the Engaging News Project has been uh, to first make sure we are looking at these metrics. These business metrics are what people are using, so we don't want to throw them away and make it even more difficult to try to make sense uh, or to help journalists try to make sense of the news. But then what we've been doing is trying to pretest tools and strategies from an academic perspective to show that they have an academic benefit and then try to field test them, share them with news organizations to give them a way to say, okay, yes, we know you need business metrics, but then also to say, we've pretested these things and not only do they help your business metrics, they also are good on a number of bene uh, beneficial, democratically beneficial um, outcomes as well. So what I want to do for the rest of the time, and I won't go into too much detail here, is just go through one project and how we tested one of the projects we've been working on at the Engaging News Project and show how we, kind, we try to balance these two perspectives and to bring in um, the academic perspective as well. 
and what this project we call the quiz tool and it's essentially a way to build on news polls that you mm. see online and look at interactivity but try to make sure uh, that if you put substantive material it actually helps people learn so the first step to our process uh, is to look and look either at the news or at academic literature and try to identify an issue that is worth uh, diving into. And here, what this is, uh, this graph is from a fairly large content analysis that a number of us did of local news sites, uh, both television and newspaper, as well as some national news sites. We were looking at the features that appeared on these sites. We didn't just look at polls, but this is what is up here. And we found that polls, uh, for instance, we found examples of everything looking at current events to also asking um, what football team should win a weekend, um, uh, the, what football team should, most deserves to win the weekend's game or something. But, so this includes all of that, but we found that polls are very pervasive. Uh, top TV news, not so much, but uh, when you get to local television, local newspaper, and even national, bigger uh, newspapers, you get up to you know half of the websites we looked at had a poll on them at the given time we looked at them. So we wanted to know, can these be effective in helping people learn if we put con or sub substantive content in them? So there's, that's a big if, but uh, we were trying to push that part. So that after we looked at the issue we were asking, we wanted to ask two questions. First, does having this type of interactivity, does asking people to answer some que or answer questions on their website, um, does this interactivity increase user engagement on the site using metrics that journalists have at their disposal? But then we want to go the step further and say, can people actually learn from this information and is that, do they learn from it and is it even better than static information? If we just give people information, are they learning a bit less than if we ask them to engage with that information? So what we do uh, for our next step is experimentally test uh, different ways of presenting information in this case, or different, uh, what we, we call conditions. So here we were comparing whether uh, just giving people information, and we specifically used national polling data so we weren't uh, using non-scientific polls from, from uh, some news websites. We were looking at national, national data for a number of different issues. All of the examples here are from the healthcare, uh, people's perceptions of healthcare in 2010. So we looked at whether just seeing the information or uh, looking at a poll, so asking people to give what they think people thought about the 2010 healthcare, uh, healthcare law um, or we even did a new kind of poll that's more of a slider, uh, slider kind of poll that's more open-ended. We wanted to see if these kinds of interaction or lack of interaction, if you're just getting the information, would help people learn about this, uh, this law a bit better uh, than just getting more information. So when we're testing this, we always, what we try to do is look both at the metrics, so we were looking at time spent, for instance, the slider quiz, and we, we tried to rename it so instead of a poll, it's a quiz because there's a right answer, it's more substantive just to kind of make a distinction between them. Multiple choice quiz and slider quiz, you engage with quite a bit more. People spent more time with that. So on a business side, that's a good thing for us to be able to say. But for us, even more importantly, was that people were learning from this information as well. Uh, the control group was just people who just were asked the question, so I won't mention that. But people who got the information but didn't engage with that information learned it less than the people who had a slider quiz or a multiple choice quiz. So not only did this help people spend more time with the information, it also helped them learn more from the information as well, which is really what we're going for. We, wouldn't, we won't, as an organization, we wouldn't want to suggest that a news organization use this kind of tool unless it can do both of those things. It helps them from a monetary perspective, but also helps people actually learn from the material. Then uh, we, for this test, we try to do this as much as possible. We field tested this quiz as well. So we partnered with um, a news organization, um, and you can click it one more time too, and we asked them to put quizzes on their news site. And they came up with quizzes that matched up with news stories they were already writing. 
So that was really helpful uh, for them because it wasn't just a national poll, it was are people learning from this specific story? And we had them put these up on a site and we tracked who was clicking um, and how, many, how much time people were spending with these. And some things we took away from this was that uh, the slider poll, if we put that on first, people were really likely to engage with that. So you could put multiple quiz there, questions together at a time. Um, and if you put a multiple choice question first and then a slider, people were really likely to engage with both questions. So in our field or in our lab, we figured out that people were learning from this and in our field test, we could see people are actually trying to use these and are spending time on the site with this kind of information. So after having all of, um, all of those steps completed, we went ahead and we're, we were felt very confident in this tool. We launched, uh, launched this tool. This is a, an actual quiz that Ken's Five, it's a, a San Antonio news station, uh, picked up or created a couple weeks ago on uh, about grammar uh, that went, I think we ended up getting about 30,000 hits or something uh, for this. So yeah, it's, uh, so this, this quiz tool is up on the Engaging News website. We have our, the statistical backing for why we think it's a good idea, as well as giving journalists the, a way to use this that is, it's not that, it's not incredibly time consuming. We're giving you the code that you can put into your site. You can, uh, you can work with the tool to make it fit uh, your needs while also knowing that there's some solid research background that shows it can help, uh, help people learn from, from the information as well. So just to summarize, uh, again, we have these two big goals. First, um, you can go ahead and click one more. Uh, first, we don't think we should throw out current metrics. This is, they're pretty pervasive as they are. A lot of people have access to this kind of information already, but they are really just about clicking and sharing. They don't show us whether people are getting other benefits out of, the, out of online news. So the next step and what we're trying to do and what we would love other academics to try to do as well is to pretest information, try to see if we can give journalists the tools that they might not have time to test themselves to really help the news users uh, who are going onto their sites. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer. Quite a guess to see whether I should click at the right time there. So, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, next, we'll ha uh, speak uh, here, Magda Koneshna, uh, speak. Uh, she is a professor at Erskine's College and has a fascinating analysis uh, around sharing and collaboration and nonprofits, which I think is potentially incredibly instructive for a lot of people in really entering journalism uh, at the local level. So, Magda. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Can you all hear me? Pardon me. <clears throat> I just moved to Philly and I discovered that I'm allergic to everything in this area, so. Um, <laughs> I was allergic to Philly, too. <laughs> um, so it's been really interesting to hear all of you talk, um, and I'm going to talk about something that sort of overlaps with a lot of different things um, that various people have said over the course of the day. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about nonprofit news organizations um, and sort of my sense about how their model um, enables them to, uh, through sharing and collaboration, to sort of prioritize quality journalism. Um, so first of all, I'm talking about public affairs journalism, um, by, by which I mean the kind of journalism that our democracy needs to function. Information about voting, for instance, um, and this kind of information, like I think Craig said, is a public good. Um, it's something like street lighting and like fish stocks that um, we all kind of share and we all benefit from, um, regardless of sort of whether or not we kind of pay into it, right? Um, and so there are arguments that suggest that this kind of public good can't be sufficiently supported by the marketplace. Um, and so in thinking about public affairs journals, and that sort of raised the question for me about, you know, where has it come from? What's going on now? Where will it come from? Um, so um, just quickly, commercial funding for journalism, of course, is based on uh, circulation and advertising, um, but I think traditionally it's also um, there have been a series of subsidies in particular for public affairs journalism. 
Um, those subsidies have come through um, sort of bundling of content and of, and of advertising, um, through family ownership, and through uh, news organizations behaving as oligopolies in the, the marketplaces that they, that they operate in. Um, by bundling, I mean that um, public affairs journalism has been sort of produced um, in part as a byproduct of commercially successful parts of news. Um, so here you can see um, last weekend you might have picked up the Green Bay Press Gazette uh, to read about the, um, the Wisconsin Badgers and their odds in the, uh, um, in the Final Four. And by paying for that newspaper, you're subsidizing this piece of public affairs journalism about the psych bed shortage in, uh, in Wisconsin. Um, bundling, though, is unraveling, right? Um, so here you can see um, there's a, an important news story there on my Facebook feed, surrounded by pictures of people eating lunch, surrounded by ads, surrounded by all kinds of things, right? Um, so I can go and read that story um, from the Toronto Star website without ever visiting, uh, I mean, I, I may click on it and, and read that story, but I'm not going to sort of engage in the other things necessarily that are on that website. Um, so that, that sort of, that form of subsidy um, is unraveling on the internet. Um, you're probably familiar with this photo of, um, of Ben Brag Bradley and Catherine Graham. Um, family ownership was another form, I think, of subsidy. Um, Families felt that um, owning newspapers brought them prestige, um, helped them affect the local political process, and importantly, they didn't necessarily expect a return on the investment that they were putting into um, their their uh, newspapers. That also is unraveling. Um, you can see here in, from 1983 to 2011, um, there were sort of six companies that controlled most of the media in the U.S. Now. Um, we've had subsequent mergers, and, and there's sort of the big four now. Um, so this piece, again, is, is kind of unraveling. Um, and the newspapers and oligopolies unraveling as well. Um, advertisers have found that they can um, obviously find you in much better, more efficient, and cheaper ways. Um, and so we've seen the, the advertising market really falling apart um, through newspapers. So what does that mean? If, you know, and I don't mean to suggest that this was kind of a, a golden age of public affairs journalism, that there was maybe an adequate amount of money on public affairs journalism, but given those changes, given the erosion of those subsidies, where might this kind of journalism come from? Um, can it be produced as a byproduct of commercially successful journalism? Maybe, and, and that's sort of the, the, the traditional model, which, as we all know, is in trouble. Um, but what about thinking about sort of the... Um, the entities that will produce public affairs journalism because of the prestige, because it might affect politics and might not expect a return, like families did. Um, those entities, I think, could be government. I think um, probably a lot of you are familiar with McChesney Nichols' argument about government funding for journalism. Um, I'm Canadian, but it, I'm not sure that there's that much appetite for government funding, for an increase in government funding in the US. Um, so I started to think about philanthropic funding through nonprofits. Um, these organizations are funded by donations from readers, um, donations from philanthropists, and some of them have various sort of commercial um, revenue streams as well, selling content, selling ads, um, selling events, uh, sort of creating events that might bring them revenue. Um, commercial funding um, requires revenue that's coming from the audience, and that involves owning the content that you produce. Um, so the Green Bay Press Gazette need to own the content that it produced, that, that, that public affairs story, um, and sell it to you, right? Maybe through a bundle or whatever, um, but it needed to kind of put a fence around its content. Um, with these nonprofit news organizations, um, these sources of revenue don't necessarily require ownership. Um, and in fact, um, they may, may require entities like readers, foundations, philanthropists, who are interested in affecting the political process and thus might um, sort of privilege spreading the content as broadly as possible, right? Um, and so these nonprofits uh, do things, uh, you know, g given that argument, um, these nonprofits um, do things that involve collaboration and sharing of their content, um, like what we heard about um, NJTV. So they might give away their content. Um, this is a button from the ProPublica website, steal our stories. They want you to take their stories um, and publish them as broadly as possible, um, in contrast, obviously, to, to how commercial news organizations operate. Um, they collaborate. Um, this is a, a, a partial list. Um, I couldn't get the whole list on here of organizations that the International Consortium for Investigative Journalists um, collaborates with around the, around the world. 
Um, they try to get their work mentioned. Um, so this is from, uh, again, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Um, I did some field work there, and uh, their work was mentioned in the New York Times, which they're thrilled about. You'll notice that um, it doesn't even mention where the information came from, right? And so I heard someone in the newsroom say, well, there's a backhanded compliment. That's the way the media works, right? They want their content out there. They want the information that they've produced out there so much that they don't mind if you don't even credit them. Um, and they try to comment, uh, sort of offer comment on the work they're doing. Um, so they're getting their reporters out to talk about what they're doing um, as another way of kind of um, uh, getting the content out as broadly as possible. Um, and so it turns out that if their goal is sort of trying to affect the political process, that may be more efficient when they're kind of not trying to own their content. Um, so again, this is a, a very partial list of um, the International Consortium for Investigative Journalists um, did a series of stories about, um, about tax breaks in Luxembourg. Perhaps you've seen them at, in various news organizations. I heard about it on NPR. They did not mention um, the International Consortium for Investigative Journalists. Um, and they're trying to track how often those stories get picked up, how often um, other news organizations are mentioning their work. And this is a partial spreadsheet. The spreadsheet ran 20,000 rows. Um, so there were 20,000 um, kind of mentions or pickups of their content by news organizations around the world. Um, they also kind of really talk about, um, try to point back to the political impact of their work, um, being that their work is, that their funding is coming from entities that are concerned about getting involved in things. Um, they need to kind of say, hey, look, um, we're having this effect. We're causing fundamental change. Um, Europe's finance minister said that our project is a game changer. Um, and they reach out to, to, to readers kind of with that kind of framing, right? Um, the, uh, our journalism gets results. Um, we know that you care about getting results, so we need you to fund our journalism. So there's sort of um, these organizations um, kind of are changing the ownership model, um, which maybe may interfere, um, I'm sort of thinking, um, with putting the idea of putting quality first. Um, so maybe sharing and collaborating with funding from entities that are sort of concerned about that and privileging that um, helps them prioritize quality. Um, and as I was on my train ride here, I was thinking about, um, I, I don't mean to suggest um, that this is sort of a panacea, right? There are tons of problems still and things to work out with these nonprofits. Um, there are sort of um, politically driven, obviously, um, you know, if you're concerned about affecting the political process, um, that can happen also in a bad way, right? Um, the, um, there are concerns about how their sources of funding are driving what they do. And of course, these organizations, um, most of them are very tiny and, and very fragile, as we heard this morning. Um, and so there are still lots of outstanding questions. Um, but I think this model might be um, sort of one way of, of privileging quality. Um, thanks very much. We're getting caught up. So, Finally, uh, Charlie Cradiville from New Brunswick today, uh, a small but robust little uh, local outlet that uh, serves a, uh, t this great town. Um, I was going to say city, but I couldn't. I couldn't uh, um, where's he gone? No, he's, he's bringing it he's, with both a paper and online presence. So, Charlie, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you to, uh, to Phil and to Jack and, and uh, everybody for putting this together. It's great to see so many people who care about uh, uh, making our, our journalism ecosystem stronger and, and uh, sort of uh, studying what it is that we all do. Um, I also would be remiss if I didn't thank the great folks at the Dodge Foundation um, whose support has enabled New Brunswick today to, to become what it is, and, and uh, also the folks at New Jersey News Commons, who, um, without whom I, I, I don't know if we would even still be around today. They certainly helped us uh, um, you know, grow and thrive over the past year. Um, I do actually uh, just want to show you guys a, 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 a short video, um, but uh, first I want to... Uh, just say that, that I did, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here because I, I attended the uh, skills. Um, I got my degree here from Rutgers. I was far from the best student, but I, I learned a lot. And what I always say is that Rutgers um, prepares you better for the real world than any other school. 
uh, in the United States. That's not necessarily a compliment, but, uh, <laughs> but it absolutely does. Um, I'm just going to go beacon rear. Yeah. Beacon. Come on. And so I'm just going to show you guys a, a short video we made uh, to uh, support a, a $15,000 crowdfunding campaign um, that was a huge success for us. So hopefully we'll uh, shine a little light on how we can do a good job of uh, supporting outlets like New Brunswick today. Is the uh, audio on? Yeah. Okay, cool. This is New Brunswick, New Jersey. It's kind of a microcosm of America. Hub City institutions like Johnson & Johnson, Rutgers University, and two major hospitals are powerful forces in the lives of millions. We have a rich multicultural arts scene, from the Jazz Project to the New Jersey Folk Festival, to cutting-edge basement shows and world-class performances at the State Theater. New Brunswick is an old city with a deep history. We are also the county seat, home to Middlesex County Superior Court and the freeholders who govern the roughly 900,000 residents of Middlesex County. This is the hub city, right at the intersection of history, culture, economic forces, and politics. A city small enough that you can know everyone, but big enough to keep discovering new things. But the city we love has a lot to work on. Corruption and scandals have rocked nearly every city department, making clear why we need bilingual free press in New Brunswick and in New Jersey. Enter New Brunswick today. Founded in 2011 by Charlie Craddeville and Sean Monahan, after the media giant Gannett fired hundreds of reporters and slashed local coverage. Without reporters on the ground, major issues were not getting the public attention they deserved. We believe sunlight is the best disinfectant, and that investigative journalism plays an important role in the public's ability to hold their elected officials accountable. With our staff of reporters, photographers, designers, and translators, made up of New Brunswick locals, Rutgers students, and professionals from all walks of life, we do our best to provide New Brunswick with the hard-hitting journalism it deserves. In 2013, we started printing monthly editions of New Brunswick Today. A grant from New Jersey News Commons helped us transition from the purely digital and expand our readership in the community. We recently purchased our first news boxes with the help of a grant from the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, giving the print edition a home and helping get New Brunswick Today to as many people as possible, especially those residents who do not use the internet or lack access at home. New Brunswick Today still has a lot to do to build on our success. We want to be able to hire more reporters and translators, expand our coverage in the city, and purchase reporting equipment such as cameras and microphones, and invest in our organization. We have a great team and look forward to continuing to provide independent news in New Brunswick. So hopefully that video... If you value independent community news that puts people first, help us by making a contribution. If you give today, the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation will generously match your donation and double your impact. So there you have it. That's hopefully something that would... Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, so <laughs> hopefully something that would uh, encourage you to give, give money to support what we're doing. But, uh, but more importantly, an example of uh, uh, something that makes New Brunswick today different than a lot of uh, the, the hyper-local outlets that are out there. Uh, just to touch on a few of the points that, that do make us different, um, the first one, and I think the most significant one, is that we actually have a large staff of uh, reporters that uh, are, are more or less embedded in the New Brunswick community. Uh, you know, I've lived in town for 10 years. Uh, I want to give a shout-out. Dan Munoz is one of our best reporters. He's, he's here today. And uh, uh, it's because of folks like Dan who have uh, worked for uh, very low pay uh, but produce very great work uh, that New Brunswick today has the level of support that it does. It wouldn't happen if it were just me, the editor, and maybe a couple other people. Uh, but we actually have a team of, of dozens of contributors, uh, each who specialize in their own different things. Um, and so that's something that makes us strong. Um, we also have a really strong connection with our audience, with our readers, um, the folks who uh, consume our news and, 
and uh, 150 of them supported our, our crowdfunding campaign. Um, so that's something that also makes us unique is uh, we have a really, really strong connection with the people we serve. Um, and we also have what I'll call a unique uh, city government here in New Brunswick uh, that, that uh, also makes our project somewhat unique. And we'll get to that in just a bit. But, um, you know, I, I do want to uh, say just overall it's... Uh, it's really exciting time to be involved in, in journalism uh, because of all the changes. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, it's evidenced by uh, so many folks coming here today and, and all the great presentations uh, that, uh, that we're going to be okay and that, that uh, when we do get through all these changes, hopefully we're going to have something uh, strong and, and, and maybe even better than what we had before. Um, but so just to go over how some of these changes are affecting hyperlocal news, at least from our perspective, um, I, I like to say we, we live in an increasingly connected and corrupted world. Um, and uh, a, a few of the things that, that come from that uh, increased connectivity that, that uh, you know, help us and help enable uh, something like New Brunswick Today to exist. So for instance, you know, the internet uh, makes reputation research really easy. Um, you know, it, it, it means that, uh, um, you know, you can, you can see what was written about somebody in a publication without having to do hours of research. Uh, you can see, uh, uh, you know, what, what comes up when you Google somebody's name, uh, and it might take you down all kinds of different paths. That's something that wasn't always the case, and, and it increasingly becomes uh, not just a help to journalists doing research, but actually... Um, adds uh, power to the journalism entities that are doing the coverage. People are aware that if you write about them in a positive light, it's going to come up on Google. If you write about them in a negative light, it's going to come up on Google. And so uh, people tend to give New Brunswick today a lot more respect than they would have if that wasn't the case, or back before that was maybe as strong of the case as it is. Uh, also, uh, you know, social media provides a huge outlet um, for anybody who can you know, master it or make the most of it. So New Brunswick Today has been very successful at building a following on Facebook, and we're working to build followings on the other social media sites, but, but that is a large source of our success, is that we have more than 12,000 people who like our Facebook page. Uh, we have an automatic audience that is going to, uh, um, you know, it's also like, it's not like we have a Facebook page for a soft drink product or something. We have something that people really want, and so they really, they really mean it when they click like. Um, also, you know, I don't have to tell you guys, video recording and, and uh, you know, sharing of videos is, is more widespread today than it ever has been, and that's something that can be a tremendous resource for a, an outlet like us. Uh, also, uh, getting feedback from our readers um, and, and doing outreach can be instantaneous now. So uh, we'll put out an article, and within an hour, we might have several pieces of feedback, whether it's a, a, a tip or a critique or a correction, um, we can get that stuff instantly now via email, via social media, uh, and uh, just, it, it just speeds up the process and, and, and helps us do our job. Um, and then also there's, there's some things that are you know, sometimes helpful and sometimes not. So there's some uncertainty about uh, the mainstream media uh, and the future uh, of certain um, you know, elements of that. Uh, there's the longstanding problem of there not really being uh, uh, much television coverage uh, based out of New Jersey. Um, and so those things can work to our advantage as a, a hyper-local startup because we're kind of filling a void that, that, uh, that isn't being filled by the, the traditional outlets. But it also hurts us, and I, I wish there was more uh, mainstream media coverage of New Jersey and uh, especially more, more um, uh, you know, aggressive coverage uh, from the mainstream media. But, uh, but you know, uh, sometimes it works to our favor, too. Um, there's also a tremendous amount of challenges that we face, and I think it's important to point out in this increasingly corrupted world, uh, an entity like New Brunswick today doesn't have it all that easy. Um, so, of course, we, we have very limited resources. Uh, you know, this started as a passion project. We didn't make any money off it. We didn't spend any money on it. Um, but now it's grown into a, a business, and we are a very resource-poor business. We depend on our readers to support us. We depend on our advertisers to support us. And... Uh, it still seems that every month we're just scraping by. Um, we also have a, a, you know, because of this lack of resources, we have trouble getting experienced people to work for us. So uh, a lot of the people who work for us are reporters for the first time in their lives, and we're happy to provide on-the-job training. Uh, but, gosh, it would be great if we could uh, uh, 
uh, you know, have enough resources to bring in some of the folks uh, who have much more experience uh, than that. Uh, teamwork is hard also. Working with a team is not easy, uh, but it's something that we've gotten good at and we have a really strong team that, that I think works very well together. Uh, but it is, it is an obstacle we face. We also have high turnover. Uh, a lot of these reporters come our way and they get good at what they do and then they get a job with someone who can pay them what they're worth. And uh, so that also makes it very hard for us to, to maintain and sustain what we're doing. Um, and then uh, there's, of course, the undermining tactics that the, uh, the powers that be might, might throw at us, uh, uh, any number of which you could imagine, or just uh, Google, Google me and you'll see. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm really, really proud of what we do at New Brunswick today. New Brunswick's my home, home city. I came here to go to Rutgers and, uh, you know, uh, basically New Brunswick today is a product of the diseased condition of the city of New Brunswick. Um, New Brunswick today would not exist um, but for um, some of the uh, problems that, that I've experienced firsthand as a resident or as somebody trying to exercise my rights uh, to be politically active. So uh, all kinds of fights and lawsuits with the city over um, uh, the ability to put questions on the ballot for voters, the ability for voters to have a choice, those kinds of things uh, made me who I am today. Um, my experience working for some great nonprofits also really uh, uh, impacted me working with uh, the Citizens Campaign. I see uh, Heather Taylor, formerly of the Citizens Campaign here. And uh, that, that is really that experience working to start an online newspaper in Patterson um, with one of the very best journalists in New Jersey, Joe Malinconico, uh, helped, helped shape me uh, to become who I am. And also my work with Food and Water Watch, fighting against fracking and water privatization and things like that. And those experiences, uh, I think they, they helped inform uh, what I do as a journalist. Um, you know, I, would, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, it, it might be easier if I had never uh, done anything political or never done anything that you would consider activism and then, uh, you know, stepped in with a fresh start in New Brunswick. But I actually prefer to have had the background in organizing and activism because I understand how hard it can be. And I understand, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the challenges that face people trying to make changes, either uh, on the legislative level or the electoral level, um, and, and how challenging it could be to organize. Um, but I just want to uh, outline a couple other problems that we have here. Um, you're, by the way, looking at the uh, second place finisher for the mayor of New Brunswick. Uh, I came in second place with 20 votes. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, I wish I was, though. Uh, and that's part of the problem here. And I, 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 I think people need to really get this, that New Brunswick today is a special newspaper because this is a special city. Um, this is a, a one-party town. There is no uh, other party besides the one that, that runs the town. Uh, we have a seven-term mayor. Uh, he, uh, if he finishes all seven terms, that would be 28 years. He's, he was sworn in when I was in kindergarten. Um, and in many ways, uh, New Brunswick, at least from the perspective of democracy, more closely resembles a third world country uh, that's still trying to, to figure out, uh, you know, how, how to do democracy. Um, but, uh, but, you know, without competitive elections and without... Uh, the community engagement is not going to work. So we think we have something here that does work. Um, I, I, I like to call it the, the Mind Street formula. And uh, I would encourage anybody, if you go to New Brunswick today, read our articles about Mind Street. Um, I've been to dozens of zoning and planning board meetings in New Brunswick, maybe even hundreds. And the usual thing that happens is they have the hearing, they have the presentation, and I am usually the only one who gets up and says anything. Um, but there was a project that the, the residents of Mine Street were very much not in favor of, and the combination of real resident opposition, somebody besides Charlie opposing these things, and real journalistic scrutiny can produce a win for the community. So uh, if you look at our articles, you'll see we looked into the plan itself. That we profiled the opposition. We also profiled some of the chaos and the process problems that the city had. Uh, we investigated ethics, and I, like I said, I, I went the extra step of filing an ethics complaint uh, against a, a city employee. Um, we also told the story of the land and how it was sold for just $1 at one point. And, uh, we even 
uh, looked at the, the dilapidated condition of the property and ended up filing a, a complaint with the housing inspectors. And, and we also covered the demolition when the developer uh, kind of dangerously knocked over part of the building into another building. And, and, uh, and all of that scrutiny provided a level of education to everyone involved, including the developer, the developer's partners, the planning board members themselves, the people who were fighting the project, and other journalists who wanted to cover it. And other journalists did end up covering it. Uh, and we even had some TV coverage of this stuff. And I think that uh, what happened with Mind Street is a good example of what can be done. Um, so just, I'll close with just a few uh, pieces of advice for how to build that strong connection with the community. Um, the first would be to, to ask the right questions. And by that, I mean, ask around and find out what are the pressing questions that people really want to know. Uh, don't just ask what, what makes you interested. So one example would be uh, we did a, a great story about the Rutgers Police Department and the New Brunswick Police Department and sort of their jurisdictional issues of where the jurisdiction starts and stops of each department. That's a question people have been trying to answer for decades in New Brunswick. They really want to know where can they pull me over and where can they pull me over. Um, and so starting with a question like that is a really good way to, to frame it. I also think um, especially if you're, if you're doing the hyper-local thing, being different helps. Um, doing what you can to be different, being creative with your headlines and the photo choices you make um, can go a long way towards helping you separate yourself from the rest. I think a lot of times people have a, uh, they're a bit apprehensive and they may strive to make their stories and headlines and photos as close to what the rest of the media is doing as possible when really you'd be better served by trying to be different. Um, and I think you know, providing a local focus to stories and elevating local voices can be a part of that. Uh, so instead of just covering you know, uh, uh, state politics or, or, or something big like Governor Christie, you can focus in on the local uh, side of it and see what local voices have to say about those issues and, and if there's any local angle to it, of course. Um, I also think you need to make it easy for people to plug in. And this is a key part of what we do as journalists. You can. Uh, do more than just say there's a government meeting tonight at 6.30 and give the address. You can specifically write a sentence that says, anyone who wants to speak on this topic can speak. And specify that people can ask questions and that there'll be a hearing and there'll be an opportunity for anyone uh, to speak about it because most people, don't, most people haven't been to public hearings and don't know how they work or what their rights are. So reminding people of their rights, making it easy for them to plug in, whether that's publicizing an event like a public hearing or linking to an online petition. We've done some great coverage of causes at Rutgers that uh, hopefully benefited from us linking to the petitions. Um, make it easy for people to find you, you know, presence on social media and traditional outlets. So having that email address, having that phone number at the bottom of every story, I get all kinds of calls because I do that and it really helps. Having a P.O. box where people can send us anonymous tips, that helps. Having a print product is, is a great thing, and if you can do that, I, I, I would advise it. Don't, don't throw anything to the curb if you can help it. Um, and then lastly, uh, I would just say that uh, you know, a, a wise man once said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. So don't be afraid to take a stand, and don't be afraid to admit when you're wrong. Uh, you know, uh, I think that the news should be free, so we use a free model, and we try to give a voice to the voiceless. And uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, all agendas come second to education. Education is first, and getting the facts right are first. So uh, it, it's, it's really about accuracy, and you know, just don't be afraid to, to, uh, to admit when you're wrong, but also don't be afraid to take that stand and be proud of what it is you're doing. And, uh, and that's all I have. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Great, Jonah. I think we've got time for maybe a couple of questions. A little bit, but... Uh, so we've heard several different perspectives here um, around how to sustain journalism, uh, engaging the audience from the outside, changing news practices, uh, the nonprofit model, and Charlie's passion, <laughs> among, beyond anything else. So questions. Great. Um, so how does someone support, support and sustain quality journalism? Um, that uh, that's actually my question. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the various models and etc. But I don't think we've come up with an answer. 
is there an answer? Is the answer nonprofit? Is the answer that it's like the priesthood, and it's like a very <laughs> humble lifestyle, uh, but spiritually gratifying? How about Magda? I was going to say Magda, and then uh, Craig. This, um, right. So I think I have tried to make an argument for nonprofits, although, like I said, it's sort of unclear whether that itself is a sustainable model. Right. Um, I did do another piece of research where we looked at what contributes to sustainability, um, and there we found that connections to a, net, a news network, which I think you all are building in New Jersey, um, and connections to post-secondary institutions are helpful. Um, so I think um, you know, because I didn't, the piece I didn't talk about is if journalism can kind of link to um, entities that themselves are sort of stable. Um, that can obviously be helpful. I, I mean, and I guess I'll, uh, I mean, I'll partially make the argument and cheat a little bit and say all of the above. Um, I mean, I think it's going to have to be a combination of a lot of things. I mean, I have, you know, models and policies that I think can be very promising. Um, but we were still in the experimentation stage. We're still really figuring out from this, this huge fallout um, that's happened, uh, you know, over the past few years. Uh, and, you know, maybe we could argue should have seen coming because of a lot of changes that were going on. We have to figure it out. I think we want to encourage as many people to do as many different things and then take what works and put it in other places. And, I mean, obviously I'm putting in a pitch, too, for, you know, when, and, I mean, obviously Charlie, through his work, is, is doing this in some really interesting ways of going out and, and, and talking to the communities about, about what they need and what they will support and giving them new reasons to, to offer that support. So, but, but I think it'll be a combination. I mean, I have, I, I think there's a lot of excitement in the nonprofit model. I worry some about, you know, scale and, and how often, I mean, ProPublica, you know, raised like $50 million from the Sandlers. And I think that, you know, over X 10 years or whatever, you know, it's like 60 journalists, you know, at their, at their budget, 60 journalists. I mean, how many, you know, uh, you know, at a major daily, you know, now even obviously more than that. And back in the day, a lot more than that. So we're going to have to really think about where are those big amounts of money going to come from? Uh, I think that philanthropists can really, really support the experiments. Um, I think in the long term, we might have to ask ourselves some pretty serious questions about what we're willing to, to do to support things that are really important for our democracy. Um, and I would argue that involves looking for who else has really big money. So I am, I don't totally endorse what the McChesney Nichols model, although I'm, I certainly they founded Free Press, and so I'm very familiar with it. But I, uh, and there are elements that I really like. Uh, we don't totally agree on the exact best solutions, but I, I think we have to have that conversation. But if it's if it's a public good, if it's a societal good, what are we going to do to support it? And that might involve different kinds of public investment. That doesn't mean government-run newsrooms, but that might mean um, finding some of those big piles of money and moving them from, say, a fighter jet or whatever over into news and information, public media. We spend a dollar fifty per capita, not even anymore, I think it's a dollar thirty five to support public media in this country, a dollar thirty five. It's nothing. Um, in Europe they're spending sixty, seventy, eighty dollars. I don't want to pay a TV tax, but what if we spent five? How many how many New Brunswick today's could we support? All right, end of sermon. I'll jump in too. I think I, I like the idea of having a lot of things to do and I know at least what my what engaging news project's been doing is kind of focusing on things that can work with the structure that exists right now. And then I love hearing from uh, different groups that are thinking bigger than that too. So I think it's nice not just to have a lot of different ideas, but to have different ideas at different levels that can be implemented more or less quickly too. So again, kind of not giving you one right answer or anything, but saying that I, I like the mix of, uh, of approaches that are going I think, so. I think we've got to have a one more question. If we have one. Is that no? Yeah. Um, I would say that uh, you know, we welcome criticism and feedback. If there's anything in the paper that people think is inaccurate, we want them to point it out to us. But uh, it's, it's certainly not not intended for self-promotion um, uh, because you know we 
the, the people who deserve the attention are not the, the people at New Brunswick today. The people who deserve the attention are the people in power, and we try to, try to shine a light on what they're doing, good or bad. Um, we often do end up, uh, you know, uh, in some unorthodox situations, and, and we do uh, end up covering ourselves, uh, and I think that we, we do a, a fair job of it. I also think that, um, you know, something we do that, that uh, shows that we're a quality journalism outlet is that we... Uh, uh, often give extensive uh, voice to our critics in our articles, um, and it's something that often says more about them than it does about us, but we don't hesitate to quote our critics or, uh, or people who, who feel that, that we're not uh, acting as proper journalists should. But, uh, you know, I, I certainly, certainly welcome any, any specific criticism about any specific situation, but we're very proud of the work we do on the whole. Great. Thank you, panelists.